the second session is going to be devoted to the question that's really guided us from the very beginning. So the question of, of racism, which, uh, which is really the starting point, I would say, in the sense that uh, racism in international relations and also in philosophy seems to have been treated as a side issue that could be somehow resolved thanks to the good will of uh, people from the from the global north. So there is this, we had this um, international relations and, and political philosophy had this feeling that we can solve it from, from, from our perspective, we can help to fight against racism. And as it happens, it didn't work that well. So um, there are still the, the, the inequalities that are still in place are not only due to all the colonial past, but are also due to our misunderstanding of what should be done. So I, I think that's one of the reasons why Srida gave the state title to the conference, Recalibrating Global Justice Philosophies, to, 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 to think how to reverse this dynamic and how to, how to make it even possible to start this conversation properly without the, uh, uh, the condescending perceptions from, from the West. From, from the global north, sorry, I was corrected yesterday by KB not to use the West. Indeed, um, I'm coming from Eastern Europe, so it, 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 it is a bit of a struggle to, to get rid of these categories, of course, but I, I stand corrected and um, thanks for, for that. So um, I'm really excited that this conversation is going to, uh, to, to, to start with uh, the presentation by uh, Dr. Jean Richardson, who is coming to us from Harvard, who's not only um, uh, a thinker in theoretical issues, but you also do some practice. So this is wonderful. You know much more than we, we could ever know for, the, for that reason. And so I'm really excited for, about, your, about your presence. You, you, you have many responsibilities. In particular, you are, coach, you are the co-chair of the Lancet Commission on Reparations and Redistributive Justice. So, well, you have uh, you are behind the closed doors, and really, we are really excited to to hear more from about it. So, please, um, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here, and I I do have lots of me envy, though I'm not uh, I'm restrained in the uh, I'm an infectious disease physician, and then I have a PhD in neurology which I know is probably the lowest run of the social science. <laughs> I don't even believe in social science, so they did that. Um, today, I'd like to uh, talk about coloniality, global health, and reparations. And I'll talk a bit about experiences that led to the uh, writing of a recent book called Epidemic Illusions. And if anybody wants to interact in the Twitter sphere, there's my, my handle. So the, I start, the book is a critique of uh, global health practice based on um, my work here with Doctors Without Borders, Partners in Health, World Bank, um, CDC, uh, WHO, mainly in Ebola outbreaks and then in COVID. Um, and and what, I, what I try to do in the book is I, I um, take inspiration from Edward Said. So you remember in Orientalism and, and cultural and imperialism, deep culture and imperialism. He said he wanted to take the great works of literature and show how they carry Western cultural imperialism. I wanted to take the great works of public health and show how those uh, carry cultural uh, imperialism. And I, I think the way it's done is through knowledge uh, production centers like King's, like Imperial, that I was just at this morning. I imagine the name is still uh, Imperial, or, or Harvard, where our, um, our motto, Ver uh, Veritas, you know, so the, in searching for truth. I think it lies the fact that much of what we do is in codes, ways of seeing the world by other people, ways that support any interest. And so I changed it to not only very top piece and was told that I can be fired for uh, messing with the, the Harvard logo. Um, so just want to say a few uh, quick words about my mentor, Paul Farmer, who uh, passed away in February of this year. Um, he was a, a guiding light in the study of structural violence in. Um, in global health, but also the structural reparative interventions going beyond just the, the biomedical in trying to address uh, global health inequities. 
and no financial relationships with commercial entities. We're going to do this in the med schools because they, they are right with uh, uh, people with commercial interests. But anyway, here's a cover of the book. And you can see, uh, you know, I, the, I start from this premise that it's hard to critique modernity using its terms of reference. So I try not to go down the big data or rational argument line and instead hit it um, with, uh, you know, outside the box approach. So you saw that GIF on the front. Here's the cover that's a play on Plato's cave. You know, I remember the, the allegory where there's people chained up and all they can see are the shadows of these figurines. And here's a uh, coronavirus. I feel like part of the, you know, the Western tradition that we've inherited is that there is a philosopher or more than that, a social scientist that can pop out of here, go up into the, into the world, like a Milton Friedman, and go into the world and say, hey, you know, this is the way things are. What I'm telling you to do as far as economic policy is based on a scientific view of the world. And that legitimates, in his case, um, elite profiting, uh, neo-colonial extraction, and trickle down economics, which doesn't work. Uh, and so my philosophy of science, and you can correct me here, maybe I'm uh, 50 years too uh, late, but I think Peter Lynch uh, was, is a guy that I like and nobody seems to, really, he doesn't seem to be that popular, but I, I don't think there is such a thing called social science. I think anything that has to do with human behavior or social phenomena um, cannot be divorced from the ideology you bring to curating these studies for that. Uh, I'm not anti-science, and I, so I don't think that there's anything I know about three quarks making proton. Uh, but I also don't think that knowledge production about social phenomena is inferior. I just think it's very different epistemically. And, and so my goal is to explore the ideology behind how we put facts together in, um, in epidemiology or in public health. So for me, the better allegory is one of a warrant. But there are actually a lot of different ways of putting social phenomena or interpreting social phenomena that lie through the forefront of our consciousness. Uh, but the ones that stick are usually the ones that support the interests. And I'll give some examples of how I think uh, public health studies do that. So I use this theory of coloniality, which is not much different than Kwame Nkrumah's uh, neo-colonialism, not too much different than Cedric Robinson's. Uh, racial capitalism. But coloniality can be described as the matrix of power relations that consist in the United West by the former colonies and shooting their nation. And this is from uh, Anima Kipano and Peru. Framework attempts to capture the racial, political, economic, social, epistemological, linguistic, gender, hierarchical orders imposed by colonialism that transcended independence movements and continue to oppress in accordance with the needs of capital. So Ramon Gross Liddell has to say that, you know, we just move, uh, all that changed were the names of places, that we still live in this world where domination occurs through political, economic, and knowledge production relationships. And so we can call that global coloniality. And then Sabelo and Lobo has to say that despite the celebration of decolonization as a milestone in African history, uh, and I focus on Africa because that's where I've lived for the last 23 years. Um, Africa has not managed to free itself from epistemological colonization. It's described on the continent and its people by the nation of secular schools, schools of tropical medicine, universities, religious denominations, and other institutions that carry Western cultural materials. So I just want to give one example of an uh, experience I had in the global health world on my you know, white savior journey, um, where I started questioning this double-edged sword that is humanitarianism. So before I went to medical school, I worked for a, uh, I worked for Doctors Without Borders in South, Southern Sudan, and people are in its own country. Um, and this was uh, the field hospital for displaced persons camp in Bentiu. Uh, here's the lab that I ran, and then here's the uh, triage and the wards. And here's what I mean, and here's where we lived. Here's one of the wards. But this is what got me started on this path to questioning the, again, the, the, the um, goals of humanitarians. So they sent us on this mission to understand why people were getting burned out of their villages and what were coming south. And, and what we found out was that in central Sudan, uh, Khartoum was sending paramilitaries down to burn people out of their village so the Chinese could do oil exploration. They were building a, a, and they built a pipeline up to Port Sudan. And since people were messing with the pipeline, they wanted them out of there. But they didn't want them to go join the Southern People's Liberation Army, which was who they were fighting in the Civil War. So they used Doctors Without Borders as a, uh, to divert people to a displaced person camp where we would 
uh, treat for malnutrition and leishmania and uh, tuberculosis and malaria and give people jobs. And with one job, you can support 40 extended family members. And I talked to some doctors out of the military garrison, and they knew all of this. And they, they, they said to me, you know, the doctors about borders is part of our military strategy to divert people going south to, so as not to swell the ranks of our enemy forces. And I thought to myself, oh, wow. So naive, I didn't know humanitarianism was going to be used for such a various purposes. But I could have, right? I could have looked at what happened in the opera. I could have looked at what happened in uh, Rwanda after the genocide when, you know, the two rebels were using NSF uh, compounds as bases for uh, incursions over the border. Um, I could have read Kwame Nkrumah, who was early as 1960, and say, be careful of this thing called aid. Really, all it does is disguise the extraction going on in the background. Um, and after this experience and working more in sub Saharan Africa and reading more, I came to realize that it's not just the aid and development that's the farce that does this, but it's a lot of what we do in academia. So we have these moral debates on obligations to the best, best to sick, and this is where they might get off, uh, someone gets off here. Uh, and I think when I went on that Sudan mission, I had been raised on in high school and maybe college the comes germs and steel argument that you know the global north mainly came to its riches through luck in having whatever grain iron uh more at hand uh, and so if you if you're taught that if you're programmed that way i was programmed that way i could see myself going to sudan as a helper uh sharing the the, the resources that i had in the place but after i've been around for a while i realized that what I, my existence in the US is essentially, um, and it's a socio historical system that holds advantage in my being. Um, then things, then my outlook changed a lot because you, you go from seeing interventions as just helping and sharing to one as, oh, I am the beneficiary of a global institutional order that systematizes extraction. Really, the only response to that is joining repar reparations campaigns repairing those legacies. So now most of my work is in the reparative realm. Um, I also saw myself as part of uh, this class of bewilderers or the uh, and I'll call it Days of um, That, and I'll give a quick example of a uh, Harvard School of Public Health study that I think commits symbolic violence or does some bewildering. When I was working for the UN and DRC on the 2019 Ebola outbreak, a team from HSBH came in and did a study on why the outbreak was so big. It got published in Lancet Infectious Disease. And the conclusion was that um, people there basically had their ignorance to blame for the, that the outbreak being so big. They didn't believe the virus was real. They thought it was a US bioweapon. Um, only they would trust the UN services more. And you could achieve that trust by building better. <laughs> It's hard to say sometimes about like WhatsApp groups, pamphlets, um, you know, uh, getting sheets involved, maybe doing some trust falls with uh, uh, with the groups. Like that, that's that would be the solution. And and so in a way, they were presenting facts, right? They asked people. The people said, "I think it's a U.S. bioweapon." They concluded, "These people don't know what they're doing. That's why they're not taking the vaccine. They're ignorant. This is why it's so big." Gets published in the Lancet comes back to the Ministry of Health in the UN and I start hearing all these things about, let's do the WhatsApp groups, let's do the, the pamphlet, and you really gotta fight this misinformation. I did a separate study where, you know, you, you talk to people and ask them, well, why do you think it's a US bioweapon? You know, and they'll start to talk about, well, you know, you know, Leopold was cutting the hands off of our ancestors uh, when they didn't get enough uh, rubber, or, um, you know, the US and, and Belgium colluded in the murder of, uh, Patrice Lumumba was our first elected prime minister. And then you installed Mobutu, who basically took money, uh, a couple hundred thousand a year, and allowed Global North corporations to ransack the East. And the DRC is one of the richest countries in the world with what's on the ground. You would never know it, especially working in Cuba. There was nothing to show as far as the health infrastructure or education system. And so um, the 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 study, which got published, I think, in like Medicine Network, I don't even remember. I, was, I published the study, uh, and I don't even remember the journal's name because it's part of this coloniality of even peer review. That the the exploration of colonial determinant, you know, colonial legacy determinants 
of the operator gets uh, you know, shunted to uh, low impact journals. Um, but to me, that it was equal factual way of describing why there was that big outbreak there, that, that we have these neocolonial legacies to deal with. Um, and so the critical theory says, right, I don't care so much about the factuality of what you got in your interviews or what you got out of your longer interviews that explored colonial determinants. What does each view do in the world? And the Harvard School of Public Health one recycles the neoliberal approaches, the aid approaches, the direct engagement in this information. The other one says we actually have to participate in reparations experience. And, and in the Lancet Commission, we have a DRC, DRC section. All the sections are run by people that were uh, benefit from the reparations that I'm about. And, and you know, it was several trillion dollars went by uh, of Belgium and the US. Um, so I'm interested in how people's perceptions are colonized. You know, how a, how a Harvard study can really set the agenda in people's minds that uh, you know, narrow our social imaginary to understanding things in such downstream terms, such that there's no responsibility uh, for the more distal forces that that actually you know, help determine these phenomena. Um, and so, Ruby Watsiango talks about colonialism imposing its control on the social production of wealth uh, through military conquest and political dictatorship. But the most important area. The mental universe of politics, the control through culture of how people perceive themselves and their relationship to the world. I mean, the stuff like this tells people how to perceive their, their suffering in, in, in an outlet. So, um, we've used this uh, theory of symbolic violence um, in another paper on, uh, where we explored Ebola survivor well being in Sierra Leone. The interesting thing about this study, what we found is that. Um, of all the people discharged, all the survivors of Ebola in Sierra Leone, the group that did the best several years after the outbreak were happened to be all the people discharged from partners in health. Because Paul Farmer's approach was not just to um, provide aggressive care for people when they were patients, but to employ every single person that was discharged. So we employed 700 survivors, all of them that came through. And that that kind of works progress administration, you know, that, that mini WPA of, of uh, employing people for, uh, meant that they had their well being many years down the road, even after uh, the jobs had ended, was, was improved. And so, uh, you know, we, the, this paper talks about the symbolic violence of outbreak, of how just uh, thinking of this, this horrible event in terms of when when viral transmission starts and when it ends. How that actually does violence because the suffering part of it continues through. But if you're, you know, you're just attending to the outbreak, almost every NGO left the second uh, the, the outbreak itself stopped and there was no attention to the resulting suffering, which was really, to me, Ebola is not the cause of this outbreak. It's a marker on a determined web that stretches back into what the mining companies are doing there, what British colonial policy was. Um, here is how I try to get to some of that uh, determinative web. So I use some determinative model in the book as well. Uh, here's the Ebola poster you would see when you landed. Uh, it tells people to, if you have any symptoms, go to the health center. Uh, what we found is that the health centers were amplifying transmission, and so we changed to this plan called 117, and that was a whole um, a separate process. To me, when you look at this closer, it also it, it speaks uh, of Ebola as causing the, the, the suffering that we were seeing here. And again, I just see it as a marker on this longer determinative web, which is better explained uh, by this poster. Um, why do we have underdeveloped uh, health centers in the first place? In fact, we wrote a separate paper that showed just, uh, just the taxes from the diamonds that have been stolen from the Kono district where we were working, uh, would have built a health infrastructure that could have stopped people in its tracks. And so when I talk about super spreaders in the video, I want you to remember that uh, back to me. But here we have epistemic violence, structural adjustment, the Holocaust of slavery, Leopold and Barbaric colonialism, all leading to the underdeveloped health center. 
For those of you that don't believe that neocolonialism is alive and well, it was very good. I mean, this slot describes that best. And in 2017, the continent of Africa uh, received $162 billion in the form of aid, loans, and advances. $200 billion came out in illicit financial loans, not repatriation of profits, illegal theft of money through trade misinvoicing, and tax evasion, and, and resource theft. So there's no such thing as the plan. I mean, problems are complete parts. So you know, you're either you did the US aid. All they do is give a payments that's completely overwhelmed by one what we steal, and then many orders of magnitude dwarfed by what we do with repatriation problems. So I'll give the example of where I worked in Kivu um, in, in DRC. There is a gold mine. Uh, there's a lot of gold there. Uh, the biggest mining company is Anglo Gold Ashanti. They take 93% of the wealth. Out of, so talk about unfair trade agreements. Ninety-three percent of the wealth out of the country. Lead shale shareholders John Paulson. Harvard School of Engineering is called the Paulson School of Engineering. He gave four hundred million dollars to Harvard to essentially launder its name. So right across the street from me in Boston, I can see this determinant web that stretches back in time. That I see in that Paulson School of Engineering the whole outbreaks and people suffer, and it's going to not get any tenure. Is what it's going to do. Uh, that's okay. Um, so, is it possible to decolonize global health institutions? I try not to use that word in the book. I think twice I say it because my positionality is you know, settled with colonists. I, I should not be sending any um, decolonizing agendas. But what I try to do is, you know, I, in all these things I've done, I kind of have a first hand view, for example, view of how farmers do their harm, especially aesthetically. And, and so, it's what I've been trying to do on. I will give two more examples of uh, symbolic violence. Uh, I'm really a critic of what we do with infectious disease models. So, you know, the pandemic models that you may have seen a lot of with COVID. I do not think they are outbreak science. You know, I think they're really fables dressed in formal language. Um, I think they set epistemic confines to the understanding of why some groups look sicker lives than others. Because to me, the purpose of a model should be gather our social imaginary and tell us where we can go to be healthier. Uh, and what the COVID models often do is just recycle inequities. So I'll stick to that one first. Um, I'll pick on the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluate at the University of Washington uh, because they have received, this is a small epidemiology that has received over $600 million from their gates alone. Uh, and they do all the big COVID models and global, global burden of disease studies. There's a good article on the nation and Bill Gates is going to start in public funding at the city. Yes. Um, so let's look at their, their initial models. They were wrong 70%. So they're, they're wrong to the point of being useless as far as uh, predicted, uh, as far as predictions. But they were very useful ideolog uh, ideologically. So Trump grabbed onto them because they said by that first summer, the pandemic was going to end. But Trump said, look at the great job I'm doing. This is where the pandemic's going to go. So they're easily co opted for ideological purposes. But on um, the issue of today's topic, I have to think they're racist. Um, they, they gather our social imaginary and they tell us to, if you know, they, they say, if you wear masks, social distance, close some businesses, you have to go from 100, uh, you go from a million deaths to 200,000 deaths. But in both scenarios, three times the number of black people are dying. So these models do nothing about the you know, racial injustice or risk structure that's built into some, why some people live sicker lives than others. Um, and you use Ibram Kennedy's definition of racism, which is any policy that increases or keeps uh, continued status quo relations of inequality, then these models are racist because they recycle in our imaginary. Uh, they, they don't even, uh, I'm going to say it better here. They, they actively delimit uh, the public's ability uh, to imagine social alternatives. So what might imagining social alternatives look like? It's part of the reason we formed this uh, Lancet Commission on Reparations. Uh, actually, yesterday I joined the uh, debt justice campaign down at one Tudor Street where we were uh, calling for debt cancellation. We, I think, um, debt cancellation is one of the first steps that would be a catalyst in the, in the reparations movement. Um, but in the academic realm, what we tried to do was, um, this is one of the, I think, first attempts from what I've heard of real anti-racist model, what would it look like to not build in, not parameterize um, uh, 
interventions that just recycle racial injustice. So we modeled what reparations for American descendants of persons who enslaved in the U.S. and what potential impact on the SARS cov transition would be. And the reparative package, and this is the one that has been designed by the people leading our section in the Lancet Commission, is to eradicate the wealth gap between white and black people in the U.S., which is 10 to 12 trillion dollars. For 40 million descendants, that's 300 thousand dollars per person. If that had been paid uh, 10 or more years prior to uh, the pandemic, we 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 show or uh, demonstrate that there could have been a 31 to 68 percent reduction in COVID as a whole. And that's the way uh, infectious disease transmission dynamics work, that interventions in the highest risk group often have benefit benefits for the population at large. So I'll just refer you to the paper if you're interested in the, in the methods and, and all the findings. Uh, I think what's interesting for here is that this man made it into the news. We've got a CNN article. And ever since I've been getting hate mail threats. <laughs> um, one, I think I'll just, skip. it's just another example of, uh, of symbolic violence, which we can, we can discuss, but I'd like to leave time for us to talk. So um, thanks very much. If there's anything to talk about afterwards, here's my email. But yeah, please. Thank you so much, Professor Sanders. Presentation on this change of topics. So we see you. Wonderful. Are there any questions in the room? Yes, yeah, thank you. I really enjoyed that. And um, uh, I've got to talk about I'm giving at the Boston School of Public Health in the Center to the member called Boston Lockdown Race. So mm. hopefully we can meet up in Boston. Sure. I'm going to be there. Um, but uh, I wanted to ask actually about that. So you, I, I, I think. The, there are lots of ways in which the modeling that happens amounted to racist science. And I, 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 I totally agree with you about that. Um, but I also think it goes, I mean, so far, I think it also goes as far as constructing the response because, I mean, what seemed to happen was that you get the universe of policy responses gets um, into one dimension, which is. Um, uh, something you put on the scale, which is stringency scale in terms of social distancing, and then it's a, it becomes a binary because anything above suppression but is going to do this, and if you've got to, so you've got to do suppression, and then this sort of gets extended over the world. So that's kind of, you know, so my stance, I mean, I was also living in, in South Africa for nine years, and I, it's based on, on that. I just thought, look, how's this going to work here? So I wondered if you extended it to the, and I know this is not a discussion of COVID, but I wondered if you extended it to the, maybe not even that example, but not but, but the actual, the way the response is constructed. Because for me, part of the issue is the idea that there's this separation between the science and what the science is used for in constructing a response. And my, my, my feeling of also, um, the, the two things can't be separated. I mean, the reality, particularly clearly in COVID, but not just in COVID, is that uh, the science is definitely pushing for a certain response, and then that response reflects the context in which the science is done. Yeah, I think if you use the reasoning uh, in our study, it, we would agree that lockdowns were racist because what we found was the number one determinant of tr high risk transmission was overcrowded housing yeah. in. In most in black households, because we use data from Louisiana, um, and we trace that back to redlining, right? So it's easy to show the, the historical force that caused this—that you know, black people were denied mortgages. That so often people have to pool money together to live in homes where more more people are there, and that I think it's easy enough to say that reparations would have um, kind of obviated that and allowed for living in households where you know you could socially distance effectively. But what that would lead me with is. Um, I mean, my personal opinion that no amount of pandemic preparedness or, you know, beefing up the CDC would help in the next uh, pandemic. I think only socialism and uh, reparations would set up the scenario where we could have uh, effective containment. And so I wouldn't, I still think you, you know, for a place like the US, if uh, they had no choice but to uh, do lockdowns because we, you know, um, even with our unequal society, I think there was no way of getting around that unless I guess we paid for like, people to go to hotels. We could have you know done things like that to to spread them out. Um, but 
I guess I'll end by saying that I also don't want people to think that we wrote that paper to say we should pay reparations so that you know the next pandemic is is uh, is better contained. We mainly used it as a heuristic because there's really no anti-racist modeling being done, just to show that it is possible to parameterize big structural forces and uh, you know counterfactuals that have that are quite radical. And since then, we actually had the NSF invite us to present the methods to their pandemic modeling group, uh, because mainly, you know, people are buying so much into this causal inference paradigm now, which to me is inherently conservative, because you can only, you know, uh, define the downstream things well enough to include them in, in these analyses. So, yeah. We should talk about Sure. Any more questions on the because I, if I may use my privilege of the chair. Um, so I was, it was really outstanding and thank you so much for this. And so super inspiring, exactly what we are trying to say. I mean, better, better question, but, but um, oh, just the, so you spoke about, uh, you, you were making fun of these WhatsApp groups and all WhatsApp initiatives. I totally agree with that and I, I, I see where you were going. But I was just thinking about, I mean, I just, I would like to know what you th what do you think about the the third party in this uh, in this dialogue between uh, global south and global north? And this third party is Russia. Mm -hmm. And the fact that this this narrative again this narratives that challenge science that say that are justified in the ways that you mentioned that it's all so good they they wouldn't be as strong as they are if there was not Russian propaganda really uh, coordinated promoting it and in uh, in order to um, do exactly what they're trying to do right now, namely to divide the world and to to uh, to, to make it to, to, to create chaos basically. So I was just wondering what is the what is the space that he, that this occupies in your thinking? Yeah, I think I've been naive to bracket that off and say, we'll eventually solve the, the Trumpian lies paradigm and that once we get to just dealing in facts, then we can really see that there are also ways to, even in the factual world, to find uh, ideology behind the way we're interpreting things. But it's not going, it's, it's getting worse. Uh, and, uh, you know, learning about how the you know Facebook algorithms favor misinformation because there gets more clicks and more. I mean, that to me was, um, so I guess, yeah, uh, it's pretty naive. That was shocking to see how much of a role just the algorithms play in it, um, let alone the, the Russian um, activity. And so how do we combat that? For me, there are people working strictly on disinformation, right? Ficti fixing, saying what's where the facts are and what they're not and publishing it. I think it's still important what the role that, so, I saw this on Twitter. You know, you have these epidemiologists that tell keep talking about themselves as experts and say, you have to do this, you have to do that. And then they end up being three months later, oh, I was wrong about that. But and so it's easy for the general public to see that you're no expert. You know, you you maybe deal in facts a little bit better, but you the way you promulgate uh from this position of authority and and you're you know without realizing that you're actually you do have a justice view. Like if you're the IHME and you're telling people to social distance, you might say that's based on expert opinion, but you're still not doing anything about racial injustice. So I look at that and say that to me, these experts who think that they're on the right side are still um, in the realm of injustice and they don't know it. But the public that's hearing them knows that they're they're not right all the time. And so I think they they undermine their own credibility by claiming this expertise. I think if they had started out with saying, I'm approaching this by my goal is to get us to 200,000 deaths. And I think this is the way it can be done. And then it allows room for someone to me but say, I think we need to do reparations uh, because et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think that type of epistemic humility would work to uh stop some of the misinformation because then all your the people are left with just saying you've been wrong enough why wouldn't i believe this kind of stuff so i think part of the problem is the authority that has been acclaimed claimed by the social scientists um 
And I guess Steve Fuller would say this, that, you know, this is the problem with democratizing knowledge, that you can't just dismiss the Trump people as ignorant or idiots. You actually have to get them to the table and say why, you know, you think this is misinformation. And, you know, if you're a pragmatist like me, you, it's almost coalition building around ju justice views. Um, so my focus is on getting some of the so-called experts to see that you're more tools of a certain ideology, even though it might be more just than the people you're railing against, you're nowhere near full justice. And um, Andy Andrews is good about saying this up at Birmingham. You know, his book is pretty powerful, The New Age of Empire. He'll say things like, you know, if you're working on a labor movement or anti-racism in your own country in the UK or the US, all you're doing is spreading around the spoils that your country is stealing from the global south. So you're no justice warrior. Like if, you, if you're not attentive to where the extraction begins, then you're still, you're colluding in it, which is powerful. I mean, it, you know, it, it's almost an indictment of, of like if I did uh, work with the homeless in San Francisco, that if I'm still not attentive to the wealth that California extracts, then I'm just colluding. And it's, so that's my point. I think there's always a, a more just view. This is kind of Rortian, I guess, right? That there's, re there's redescriptions of situations that can get more just, they can get more elitist, but none of them has a, is the final vocabulary on something. Okay, oh, awesome. Thank you for this. Um, so uh, just one note and then two questions. So um, I just want you to know that there's a performance going on. Uh, so it's after the slave ship, and they are doing a musical stuff. So the timing was quite wow. Um, so this is and it's taste for it. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, and so, uh, so there's a, it's a performance piece and stuff. So I just want you to know that that's what's happening on the side. Okay. So, um, so I was <laughs> I was interested in your argument about IHME is racist, um, and it's sort of there's two parts to it. One is that it kind of depends on what some guy who I don't know said. So this guy says, if you don't do something about, if you don't do something about racism, then you are racist, mm -hmm. right? And then you sort of launch that and you sort of say, therefore IHME is racist because it doesn't do anything about structural injustice. So it's the idea of you didn't cause it, you don't, you're perpetuating it by not addressing it or acknowledging it. Right. So it's just your your argument just turns on what some guy said is your I just want you to help me help me understand why it's racist not to not to explicitly identify the racist components within your argument. Right? right. Like that seems like what you're saying is that it's racist if you do not explicitly make it clear how the analysis is actually uh, structurally disadvantaging racialized populations. So that's one piece. The second thing is that, um, so IHME is essentially Christopher Murray's vision, right? That's very big oh. deep. That, so there was a conversation about 20 years ago when we first began about whether you should look at anything uh, social or whether it should be just on in the bodies of the Dalia and so on. So he was very clearly like, there does not exist anything beyond the body. So we just measure what's wrong. Or the wrong. At that time, no one called it a racist by saying basically that you racist, racist, in the lives of racial qualities because it's biological, right? Like he's just being yeah. saying, I only want the biological facts and so on. So, what, so I, I just want you to tell, want to say that the IHE, the IHME, Erasure of racism is long standing. It's not something new. Um, and so, therefore, you know, it's, it can be much more than just simply some guy said racism is this, and therefore what I mean is doing is racist. So, first, is how strong is that defense that racism is not, you know, explicitly being clear about how whatever it else is going to do racism? Yeah. And two, this IHME is a racist actually it's more fundamentally about this guy saying help is only what happens on the body and not get anything beyond just so they're what the fox and lost or and like what we get on the So how would you address that basically? 
So yeah, I mean, uh, the first part, why do I think it's racist? I mean, their stated goal is to improve the health of populations. I and mean, they're not improving the health of populations by codifying racial inequities. So I think it goes against their stated general purpose. Um, they may argue that, well, it's too much to throw those into the models because then we're not holding enough, you know, uh, um, uh, holding enough variables constant to see what actual ma mask wearing would do. And to me, that again is just a, um, it, it's kind of a cop out um, for uh, doing things. You know, they're paid by the arch monopoly capitalist of our time, um, and so they're going to toe the line. There's a reason that he uh, is getting paid to do these things because he has he has the ability. I don't know if you've ever seen him in some of these data contexts. It's like my Global South colleagues despise him for the way he runs roughshod all all, all over them to um, to either take data, uh, to not share data, to invent it when when he needs it. So I've, I've done some ethnography of people that work with him in the the IHME. There is a reason that this person has risen to the reception of many hundreds of millions because he supports this, uh, what you might call, um, you know, Gates and Pinker, this new optimist uh, perspective that uh, things are getting better, that all we need is more data to make them better. Um, and I disagree that, that things are getting better. I think it depends on the metric you use. So for example, the Gates and, and Pinker will tell you that there's less people living under extreme poverty using the 189 cutoff from the World Bank, right? And if you use that cutoff, it's true. There are less people than 30 years ago under the poverty line. If you change that to $7, there are many more people uh, under poverty, uh, under the, that poverty line than there were 30 years ago. So you can come up with the exact opposite interpretations of the world just based on the metrics you use. And the metrics that are paid for currently are ones that continue to support, I think, you know, they, they uh, occult reparative approaches, they support IP. Um, I'm not the, I think I'm one of the few might, you might hear call it racist because the people that believe also believe that it is are most our global South colleagues that, you know, think there are jobs to lose um, uh, if, if they make these claims. I, I don't, so I don't like, I mean, I guess it's an ad hominem argument, but I can see in just the way he's built the burden of disease empire that there is, I mean, he's also one of the highest paid academics in the, in the state of Washington. I think he gets paid as much as the football coach where you know, it's eight times more than anybody, any of the other professors and they, they publish it in the newspaper. Like he, this is a, he is a tool of empire, right? But for me, like full stop. Uh, and, and that's what I think it's a, it's why I pay it. it it's why I use him as kind of like your uh, ideal type or an archetype for it. Because to me, it's pretty easy to see how uh, these views, which do nothing for dismantling uh, structural inequities, get promoted, uh, get paid for, get all, get, get all the money thrown at them. Or, you know, if it was the other way around, you know the, the the approaches that the reparative people are 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 putting out there would get the 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 huge millions, and they're not because that would mean taking away the money from where it came in the first place. I mean, I know this firsthand. I've been trying to raise money for an eco socialist think tank, and the billionaires I've approached said, "Oh, you're you're creating something that you think billionaires are a policy failure. Why would I give you money if you want to like undermine my existence in the world?" It's like, yeah, and I found one person that that is ready to, but. Um, I think he is a product of, that's why I put that Nation article there, that he's a product of how Bill Gates's billions can distort public health data. And that may seem too strong or ad, hom ad hominem not coming from me, but I, I've anthropologically analyzed uh, how IHME operates much more than I was able to display in, in the half hour. Yeah, I mean, just to follow up, sorry. Just yeah, please. No, it's good. So I want you to know that Christopher Murray also uh, brought together a bunch of philosophy majors. And so what you know, what you are doing is also, in a way, saying that the whole bunch of philosophers that essentially 
validated or discussed or engaged or also supported in that kind of project, which has, I don't know if you saw this sort of book that was written called like Population Health Measures or something like that. It's this very good book. You'll see a whole section written by philosophers. Yeah. Um, and so not everybody agreed with me, but I just think that it's a it's an interesting point because while some of us might have thought of this as being a racist project, it's all very much like no 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 we we got the input of all the world leading philosophers and moved on and done all this and it's got all stuff and so so to hear you say that actually this is just fundamentally like this and then to know that there are all these philosophers involved really you know presents a particular problem of like okay so how do we separate the philosophical work that was done versus how much of this is all this other kinds of what you call you know, like yeah, so it's just it's it's a continuous thing of like how much do we pay attention to the people and the sociology of what they're doing mm -hmm. versus what's actually the philosophical or uh, because because no one would disagree that measuring you know this kind of measurement the dali is valuable like mm -hmm. it's the valuation and the use of it and how that's the problem. Mm -hmm. right? like, so I'm just sort of I think that Kleinman's that. written on right how the dali is a. Uh, it's a you know very poor uh, measure of, uh, of why people suffer in the world, right? It might it might quantify it. Um, I would say ninety five percent of the colleagues I work with in the global south despise the IHME, um, and and so I guess I have just a different experience of, of colleagues and their and their interpretation of of what the IHME does for the world. Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, I'll. There's I, no. There's no, yeah. no, I'm just no, no. I mean, but I maybe I'm I'm far off in this in my interpretation. I think the Nobel Economics Prize does a similar disservice to the world. I I was I'm trying to write a paper on how how many people I think have died on account of just the invention of the Nobel Economics Prize in 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 um in supporting mostly. Uh, economists that are off to the right, but even the, the the people that won it for the the you know the randomistas at Harvard, I'm like I'm aghast. That, 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 oh yeah, well one of them is that wasn't Esther and yeah. the other guy. I, I'm aghast that that type of work um, uh, rises to the level of of you know a universal award because it's not reproducible. Uh, I think it's unethical. It it talks nothing about again the structural determinants. I mean, there's lots of reasons. I mean, that's another. But um, to me, they all fall under a kind of similar thing. That there is a pattern of the people that are popular that get the money that get the awards, uh, and that pattern uh, is one that supports the status quo that we see. And all you got to do is walk around. I came from Dublin here and was just shocked at the architecture and seeing how what. The funneling of colonial wealth can build as compared to a, a capital right across the the sea. Um, I mean, it's not like I don't I see it in the U.S. too, but um, the the that's just my personal opinion. That's my interpretation. That's the Warren I live in. Uh, is that what we consider mainstream academic practice, mostly on the social science side? more often colludes in creating these status quo inequalities or this worsening inequality. If you go by the $7 thing, we actually have worsening inequality in the world. There is no progress, right? So, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, so something I, I absolutely support this point about the Nobel. Yeah, Prize good. Is, um, it, it always astonishes me that economists but always say if you're citing a mobile phone, they always mention the mobile phone. Yeah. And you can't mention them without sure. that, that means you don't have to argue anymore. You just you just mobile phone. Exactly. You can get that, that halo around it. But so, so I have heard this figure out some more um, today. So, um, and, and that's really interesting before. But uh, can you do a similar thing on the measurement of the the disease burden. So what you've got there, you, know, you, you change the measure and the picture changes. But if we got rid of the, 
Dali and you replace it with something else. Would we say different picture of global health? One of the reasons I don't think she's worried about that is that it's a bad measure. Pretty much whatever measure we have will see the same picture. Yeah. Um, but, but I know one when you've got a good view about that. I mean, I use the poverty one because that one's easy to show how just changing the metric gives you the opposite. You know, the maternal mortality has decreased, under five mortality has decreased, so you could call these things progress. But you could also say, and I believe this, that even though 50 years ago, under five mortality around the world was higher, our current ability to make it near zero around the world is at its greatest right now. So I would... Therefore, say we live in the most immoral age in history because the difference between our ability to affect these things and what they are is greatest, even though they might be lower than they have. And so this is where I would say, even if even if Chris has been a part of getting the under five improved, maybe he has with some of these statistics, uh, he's still part of the the this rubber stamp on it's okay, this most immoral age in history is okay because there's been progress. I mean, Malcolm X described it as you put a knife in someone's back and you do a service to them by pulling it out two inches, e even if you're in the position to pull it out all the way and suture it, right? And I think that's what Chris and Bill are up to. They like, they, they, they're proud of pulling the knife out two inches. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, I hope uh, Jean does I with your name to stay with us for the for the ending discussion of this panel because I would like to uh, to hear our next speaker who is with us, uh, Dr. Sergio. Let me just remove the pin here so much for operation that I'm trying to do. You know, but how does it feel? How does it work? Pin one of them. So maybe if he starts his video, it will work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As for now, it's uh, I mean, all good. So please, Dr. Soji, so, are so, 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 you here? Wonderful, almost here. Great. Can you say something, please? Hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you so yes. much for this. So, um, yes, we are just looking forward to hear you because your book was presented by Srina as the starting point of the whole discussion. So we, 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 we take your thesis as our uh, inspiration and we really look forward to hear you and to know more about your thesis and about your concrete work, which is, which is obviously also uh, something that we would like to be the five. Thank you so much for accepting this invitation. I hope that you did survive waking up like in the middle of the, of the night and the door is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning. Or should I say good afternoon? It's uh, the we are uh, out here in California and I'm delighted uh, to be with you. So thank you very much for having me. Um, where shall we start? We're talking about the injustices of power, dy of power dynamics, of power imbalances in global health, and crucially, about who bears the responsibility for righting the wrongs. Now, ideally, we could go back centuries, perhaps a thousand years, and work our way to the present. That would really be superb. But for the sake of brevity, Let's start just some 130 years ago. And since uh, many of us, are in, uh, many of you are in London, let's think about London. So some 130 years ago, uh, the empire was roaring, the British empire was roaring. And that meant lots of sailors all over the world, transporting goods, and those goods uh, hundreds of years ago included humans. And many of them were coming back to Britain with strange things called tropical diseases. And those diseases actually had negative effects on the investments made by the traders and investors at that time. So one of the brilliant ideas they came up with 
was to establish institutions that would investigate the disease outbreaks and these guys were bringing back with them. And so in 1898, the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, an extraordinary center of learning was established, like they funded from the private sector. In fact, a gentleman named Sir Alfred Jones put up 350 pounds to found the school. So the school will investigate disease outbreaks and teach. And Ronald Ross, who was the first full-time lecturer there, went on to win a Nobel Prize for his work on malaria. Six months later, the London School of Tropo Tropical Medicine, as it was then called, was founded to open its doors. And that was funded essentially by money from the colonies because the money that came from the British treasury was later recouped from the colonies. Not to be outdone, King uh, Leopold II in Belgium funded what now became, what has become the, uh, the School of Tropical Medicine at Antwerp. And then others sprang up in Amsterdam, etc. And then here across the pond, in the earlier part of this century, the Rockefeller Foundation invested a lot of money in establishing similar schools in many parts of the world. And they also put, uh, they, they also invested in the Harvard School of Public Health and the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. Now, why is it important to recount this? So there arose this network of institutions, institutions uh, that have contributed enormously uh, to knowledge over uh, the past century or so. But remember, the initial origin was to serve colonialism and the imperialist ambitions. And British expeditions during that time, uh, regardless of any protestations for, to the contrary, had nothing to do with civilizing the natives. Uh, the natives were doing very well, thank you. After all, uh, many of those exhibits currently at the uh, currently at the British Museum were plundered from those natives who supposedly needed to be civilized. So it just doesn't make sense that people coveted other people's possessions and then says we are the ones going to civilize them. But let's let's move on. So this network of knowledge became essentially the health wing or the public health wing, if you like, of imperialist expedition. And then after the Second World War, fast forward uh, with what has now evolved into development assistance for health or foreign aid for health as we currently know it, there was a functional, and I use the word functional, uh, merger of the foreign aid enterprise with the pre-existing knowledge enterprise. Now, what did that do? The result was a very lopsided relationship between the global north and the global south in what we now call global health. And how does that manifest? In short, it means that in many of these deliberations, unwittingly perhaps, the global north dictates the terms of engagement and it dictates when the global south can have what on whose terms. Now, I'm painting it in very broad terms. Of course, there are tremendous variations in time and over time. So you might say, given all we've heard today, including what uh, the previous speaker so eloquently pointed out, who bears the responsibility for writing these wrongs? What will it take to recalibrate this power imbalance? And it might be reasonable, as some will argue, that the first, uh, the, the, the thing that, that needs to be done is reparations for the plunder that was visited on the former colonies by those who plundered them.
it's more complex than that. So let's split the, the challenge into two. And the first one is a proposition, a reparations proposition. The second one is what will it take to reorder the structural and institutional mechanisms through which these inequalities and these, in, uh, these injustices are perpetrated. And that's what I'm going to focus on this morning. The first one on the reparations to me is fairly straightforward. If you steal something from somebody, you must pay it back. On the second part, which is now focusing on the structural imbalances and the institutional mechanisms through which uh, they are mediated, uh, the power imbalances are mediated. I address uh, at great length uh, in my book to which, uh, to which uh, reference has been made this morning, and that is this book, uh, Global, Global Health in Practice, uh, there. And this, the subtitle you can see is uh, about uh, investing in investing amid pandemics, denial of evidence, and new dependency. That's the, uh, that's the title of the book. So with me. Let's continue. One of the streams of thought is that the powerful entities in global health should voluntarily step back and give up power to countries and leaders and institutions of the global south. And sometimes that manifests, not entirely, but sometimes it manifests in what is called decolonization. And I want to stress, it has merit, okay? I'm not contesting that. In practice, however, it is very rare to have a situation in which an entity that dominates a particular construct that is powerful in that construct just voluntarily gives up that power because power is the capability or the capability to set the terms of engagement, to define the narrative and to enforce them either actively or indirectly. Therefore, despite protestations to the contrary, that kind of expectation is unlikely to have durable success. I'm not questioning its legitimacy. I'm just questioning, just pointing out uh, the stone cold reality on the ground. And you've seen how this plays out in the ongoing COVID pandemic, especially in the first two years. You witnessed uh, the, the grotesque global uh, inequities in access to basic technologies, diagnostics and vaccines and therapeutics. So to expect the wealthy countries of the global north to voluntarily walk away from that construct out of some kindness of their heart is naive in the extreme, regardless of any activism anybody might wage on social media, where does this lead us? Stay with me. I posit that the responsibility for fundamentally changing the current construct lies with the countries of the global south themselves. Their leader, the political leaders, their institutions, their civil society, and crucially, their citizens. So, one of the ways through which the current construct is perpetrated is the dependency of the Global South on the Global North for the financing of basic health services and commodities. And I call this, this whole complex, I call it the neo-dependency. 
So I'm positing that the problem, the fundamental problem that needs to be solved is not neocolonialism in global health. It is neo-dependency. Now, why is this a rot at the core of the problem? A number of countries in the global south, when they progress from low income status to lower middle income status, have increasing capability to fund more of their own basic health services from their own budgets. And if you look at the data, you find a strongly positive correlation between total health expenditure on the one hand and income per capita on the other hand. But many times the countries do not take that responsibility. Instead, if and when foreign aid for health declines, the slack is picked up not by their own government budget, but by the public, which increases out-of-pocket expenditure, which is the most inequitable form of financing that you might want to think about. <laughs> Excuse me. And if you think that the, uh, the NHS is getting squeezed and is on a downward spiral, well, take a trip to some of these countries and talking about where out-of-pocket expenditures can be anywhere between 40% and 75%. So next time you need hip replacement surgery in the NHS, imagine that you are paying 75% out of pocket. So what is the remedy? Let's cut to the chase. Number one, stop foreign aid for health in terms of as we currently know it, stop foreign aid for basic health services, diagnostics and medicines that are on the essential medicines and diagnostic list of the World Health Organization. No more traditional foreign aid for things like maternal and child health services, routine childhood immunization, insecticide treated bed nets, et cetera, et cetera. The reason is, the need for them are so predictable. The interventions are so cost-effective that, and the interventions for them are so cost-effective that they should be the primary responsibilities of the countries themselves. Now, this is not a call for an abrupt cessation and stop it tomorrow, no. Most countries have signed on to the, the, the promise of universal health coverage by the year 2030. So that's eight years. Well, let's give it eight years. Now come end of December 2030, there'll be no more traditional foreign aid for maternal and child services and all those things that I've listed. So countries have eight years to prepare. Now there might be house of no there might there'll be house of protest from certain quarters. And I get it. Any entity that insists on continuing to fund such commodities should finance them through factory gate subsidies. Subsidize the products at the factory gate and get out of the way and let the countries buy them by themselves or through their own named agents. Now, the house of protest will come from entities like USAID. And USAID is the poster child for extraordinarily bad practice in development assistance for health. If you wanted to set up an entity to undermine development in global health, you would construct it like USAID as it functions today. And I'll give you a specific example. Some years ago, an entity was set up called the Affordable Medicines Facility for Malaria to subsidize the medicines at the factory gates and let it flow through the public and private sectors to the countries. It worked. The independence evaluation was published in 2012 in the Lancet, but it was a threat to the preferred business model of USAID. Why? They preferred to give the money to their contractors who are based in the US, who would then buy the medicines and then go and run projects in the countries. So USAID bullied the global fund and they killed that initiative. 
So let's just cut down to, let's, let's face the facts. The model of Ningyong run by USAID is not in the interest of those countries. So we talked about uh, ending the, the traditional approach. That's one. What will replace it? The point is not necessarily that you stop using that money for development assistance, but refocus it where it's going to add greater value. Focus on enabling the development of institutions in the global south in disease control, research and development, quality assurance, technology assessment, etc. Because the focus ought to be that the country should not need the same kind of assistance 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now. And that has implications for the, another change that is needed, reform technical assistance. Now everybody sit up. The generation of your predecessors in those Northern institutions burned a lot of fossil fuels going to countries of the global South to give them technical advice. Now, if you train surgeons in the university hospitals in, Lon in London, I'm using London because you're sitting in London, you, the professor of surgery, you trust those who graduate from your program to do surgery on members of your family. But for some reason, in public health academia, you almost don't trust your graduates to do the same. So you have to keep going back generation after generation to give them technical assistance because you have to be the principal investigators and the natives have to be the ones who actually do the actual work on the ground. And then the principal investigator takes the glory. You got to turn that on its head. How? Abolish technical assistance as it is currently known. Put that money in the drawdown facility and let the countries themselves be the ones who will be in charge of the terms of reference, the procurement and selection of those who give them technical assistance from wherever it is and publish it on the web so it is transparent. It also means that for an entity like King's College or the London School or uh, the Liverpool School or any of them all over the world, if you subscribe to a notion that you know, five, 10 years from now, they will not accept any grant from any entity in which the principal investigator or co-principal investigator is not based in the global south. How is that for real change? Then there is more that is coming. There is, there is, uh, th th there is more that, that, that needs to be done. This is going to have an effect in countries of the global south. Why and how? Because it will become more difficult for leaders in the global south who have abdicated their responsibility for the health of their own people to always blame people in the global north as the root of all evil, to always blame countries of the global north as the root of all evil, okay? It is very common that leaders in many of these countries make promises, they don't fulfill them, and then they always blame some hegemon elsewhere. Well, those hegemons have some things to answer for, but it's not the case that they're the ones responsible for everything. And when Northern entities persist in what they currently do, they undermine not just the sovereignty of those countries, but they deny them agency and they infantilize the leaders of those countries and the institutions of those countries because they just cannot do it for themselves. We have to do it for them. And I've been privileged to work across the world. And one of the most important traits that I see or factors that I see in those countries, the low and middle income countries that have made progress in strengthening their own health systems and getting services to their own people and reducing the financial stress on the sick is what I will call 
the seriousness and quality of the leadership. That's very important. It seems like a nebulous thing, but it is there. They set their own directions. They learn from others. They negotiate and they just go at it. They gritty work day by day, year after year. They don't depend on utopian declarations that, oh, we're just going to achieve perfection, especially when those utopian declarations are premised on external donors committing virtually open-ended amounts for indefinite periods. Go to the WHO website, you will find that between the year 2000 and the year 2019, as development assistance for health increased in low income countries, domestic budgets proportionately shrank during that period. So there is at least partial, domestic budgets shrank. It's not necessarily one-to-one. -one. So there's at least partial substitution that is going on. That's an element of dependency. That is the quantitative substitution but there is also qualitative substitution. And that qualitative substitution comes in the form of people abdicating responsibility for the health of their own citizens. In country after country, I experienced some variant of the following. When you challenge some senior officers, officials, that why are you not putting more money into your own basic health services? Why are you not buying your own insecticide treated bed nets? Why are you not upping the money? For, uh, for routine childhood immunization in your country. They say, look, we're not stupid. We know that all we have to do is nothing. And then those Europeans and North Americans who love us more than we love ourselves will convene replenishment meetings. They will have billionaires on stage, expired soccer stars, expired movie stars, and they raise more money and the cycle will continue. So, the global north needs to have the, 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 the fortitude, if you like, to step back from what I will call narcissistic charity. Okay, this, this feel good narcissistic charity. And the countries of the global south need to step up and take responsibility for financing and managing their own health systems for the health of their own people. That's the crux of it. These are not going to be easy to do, but they need to be done. So, and I think I'm going to close on a very, very optimistic note. In fact, in my book, the last sentence in the book is my favorite sentence. And it says, a brighter future is possible. I genuinely believe that this brighter future is possible. So back to you. I look forward to our discussion. Wonderful. So uh, thank you so much for this. I was really, uh, I, I, I know that there are questions, I see hands already, but I was just wondering whether you would like to comment, uh, given the continuity between your two talks, would you like to add something just quickly or I'll just no, I'm just uh, okay, I, sure. love, I love the presentation. It was yeah, yeah, I'm not surprised. Yeah, yeah. It was wonderfully coherent. Uh, so uh, it, it, it was a great panel. Please, questions and remarks, uh, uh, Alex and Gabby. Thank you so much. I found that really interesting. Um, I mean, I'm British. I lived in Johannesburg for nine years until just recently. I worked at the University of Johannesburg. And um, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, the picture in, in the highest level you're talking about seems to be one of a kind of complicity between sort of external forces that are profiteering and um, and then a kind of uh, internal leadership that's also profiteering. And um, I, by the way, fully agree about the funding point. I'm applying for a British Academy grant at the moment for writing workshops, um, and which I'm gonna do in Africa with colleagues at University of Johannesburg. But it requires that you have a British EI, EI based at a British institution. So that's me. But um, but it's frustrating 
I mean, I could, I would be the same person three years ago based in Johannesburg, but I would not have been eligible. So it's, it's, it, it's, uh, it just makes no sense. Um, and again, I was at a, an event in the in Nairobi years ago, inaugurating the Kenyan Young and Family Sciences. So this is to your point about agency, and it was funded basically by the Robert Bosch Foundation, which was great. But what then the person from the Robert Bosch Foundation gave a talk at the end. She said, "Look, we're very happy to fund this, but it would be nice if at least a bit of money came from the Kenyan side." And um, so she was making the same point. Um, what I really wanted to ask, having said all that, is so um, it's a, I think it's a huge difficult problem to solve. And I think what you seem to be saying is, on the one hand, on the external side, on the you know us sitting in London side, it's um, cutting off uh, aid, and then on the uh, side in say African countries or other uh, other countries that you're talking about, it's encouraging leaders to take responsibility. The question is though. Um, what if it goes wrong? And I realize that that is exactly the argument that gets used at whatever the IMF. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, if there's agency, there must be a possibility that it goes wrong. Otherwise, it wouldn't really be agency. There's no guarantee that things go well. And the question is, that, is it, suppose, suppose there were a short term problem with a longer term, brighter future? You know, is, is that good? Is, is that something you? Would countenance that you think should be countenance? Because I can see that I see that being the argument that is going to confront any of these sorts of attempts to to you know to be to, to be tough to be kind kind of thing. Yeah, um, that's a great question, and on the surface it has merit. Let's tackle it in two parts. The technocratic part, which is very useful, is to ask, compared to what? Because it's, it's compared to the current trajectory. So if one holds that the current trajectory is the right way to go or is the most robust way to go, then stick with it. But what it means is that we're going to get more of the same. Okay. But we can actually dig uh, deep even within, uh, even within that uh, technocratic dimension and reframe it as what will it take to succeed? What are the things that might go wrong? How might those, how might those risks be mitigated? And then what are the residual risks? We can even do a thought experiment and say, well, Suppose we had gone, uh, we had made this change 20 years ago. Where might we be now? What are the things that, possibly, that might uh, possibly have gone wrong? How, how might they have been fixed? So that's on the technocratic side. On the socio political side, I would say that is probably the most patronizing argument one could come up with. That what if, what if things go wrong? It's in the very process of encountering problems, resolving them, daily transactions and bargaining, and strengthening a compact between the government and the governed that development happens. And I'm quoting Angus Dating here, you cannot develop somebody else's country from outside. Because the last time some people set out to quote unquote civilize others and develop their countries, we all know what happened. They just plundered the countries. Or somebody, or so some people have said the only reason that the pyramids of Egypt are not in the British Museum is that they were too big to be moved. <laughs> because as part of civilizing the Egyptians, the British will have looted. Those pyramids too, the way they looted just about everybody else's treasure. And then they turn around and say, well, if we, if we were to return these treasures from where they were stolen, the natives cannot possibly take care of them. So let's keep them here. So I think the argument that what if something goes wrong, I think is exceptionally patronizing. 
And it's just, it's, it's bunk, if I may use that phrase. I'm not gonna use a, a more colorful phrase that uh, folks use in the pubs of England, but I think it's, a, it's not the right argument. The right, argue, the right question is, what are the challenges that will arise? How can they be mitigated? And what will be the residual risks? I, mean, I agree, I agree it's patronizing. My point is that it is the question that gets asked. And in the internal logic, at least, of public health, that you cannot say um, it is okay for more people to die if we do this. There are other reasons why we should do it. it and, and I mean, that's what people mean by it goes wrong. They mean more people will die if we do this. And you can say two things. You can say, no, more people won't die, which I, I mean, I agree with Angus Deaton. I think he's right. I, so I'm not, but I, I just am curious to know how one, what does one say to that? It, it, you know, it, 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 either it's a guarantee that it's not going to happen. We really don't think that's going to happen. Or we admit it will, but nonetheless, that's part of the process. And I, I, I just, I mean, I agree with you. It's patronizing to say things can go wrong. It's infantilizing. Um, nonetheless, within the logic of global public health, um, which has that history, what is the answer to that? I mean, I, I, yeah, so I, I'm just, yeah. It, it's, a, it's a fair question. And that is why a transitional period is helpful, as I pointed out. It's not a switch off from one day to the next. So we say a period of eight years and everybody is on notice. So the donors in the current system are on notice and the recipients for want of a better term in the current system are also on notice that eight years from now, that it's, it's a progressive transition or a gradual transition, if you like, to that eight year, uh, to that, uh, eight year mark and importantly, it means within the countries, citizens preparing themselves and civil society preparing government. Now, come this time, you, the prime minister, you, the president, you, the finance minister, you, the health minister, you're accountable. You will no longer be blaming uh, Washington, DC, London, New York, uh, Geneva, pick your uh, favorite city for whatever goes wrong here. That's one. A second aspect, uh, instead of the wealthy countries worrying about what might go wrong, they should stop enabling or closing a blind eye to looted funds coming to their banks. Maybe if kleptocrats in some of those countries were no longer able to put their money in Zurich or in the city of London, maybe uh, the level of corruption in those countries will go down and some of that stolen money will actually stay in the government coffers and be available to finance health services in their countries. Now, I'm not at all suggesting that uh, corruption is the exclusive preserve of low and middle income countries. As, as I noted in the book, uh, there's a stunning amount of corruption uh, in high income countries themselves, including Britain. Okay, actually, the, the Guardian did a very nice one on uh, your former prime minister, uh, David Cameron, who said that certain countries were fantastically corrupt. And he was right, by the way. Uh, and he said so in the presence of the Queen. Well, then the expose they did on uh, Mr. Cameron himself was that his political afterlife exists in a zone uh, that cannot be dis uh, described as pristine. Uh, if, we, if we can use parliamentary language. So I don't want anybody to get up and say, oh, those countries are corrupt and we are not corrupt because that's, uh, that would be utter nonsense. But the, 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 point, the point is, set a goal and then say, what, what is it gonna take to make it happen? And what are the things, the, the principal risks here and how will those risks be managed? Because let's face it, there is nothing extraordinarily difficult in delivering basic, and I'm talking about basic, prenatal care and intrapartum care. There is nothing extraordinarily difficult in importing and distributing insecticide-treated bed nets. One of the problems 
is that a foreign aid industrial complex has arisen on both the commodities side, the service delivery side, and the technical assistance side that frankly elevate these things to the difficulty level of astrophysics. They are not. So you can do a thought experiment. What will happen if tomorrow you say, okay, absolutely, nobody from the global north, no institution from the global north goes to the global south to quote unquote deliver knowledge there for the next 10 years. I don't think those countries are going to collapse, quite frankly. I actually think the people who cannot do without the current system are those in the global north. And the corrupt leaders in the global south who have failed to take responsibility for the health of their own people. And this is important because you, you also have a whole industry out there, uh, what I will call the, the, the industry of high decibel outrage. Okay, that everything, all the evils of the world are because of the global north and just give us your money and get out of the way and then the world will be a better place. I think that is silly. That is not to deny all the things I've laid out as to how the global north established and continues to perpetuate those injustices. No, they're front and center. But the point I'm making is the low cost of action, the low cost of accountability ought to start with the leaders of the global south themselves. Otherwise, if we have angst about what might go wrong, it means we're implicitly satisfied with the kinds of things that went wrong in the first two or three years of, uh, uh, of the COVID pandemic, because that is the current reality. The current reality is not a pristine utopian situation. It is one in which there's gross inequity of access to basic things like diagnostics, because the countries of the global north impose this, uh, this, uh, this regime on the rest of the world and use it to deny others access to those basic services. It's what happened with the vaccines. It's what happened with, uh, with diagnostics, for example. It's what happened during the HIV, the early years of the HIV pandemic, for example. You know this very well. So we must always ask ourselves the compare to what question. So I think the way I will uh, con conclude my, my response to this excellent question is always start with who takes responsibility for what. Go through the compare to what question. Avoid uh, patronizing and infantilizing uh, those in the global south and instead focus on risk management and identification of residual risks. Back to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, we have some last question and uh, last response, which I hope is going to be a little bit uh, quicker. Uh, which we really regret not to have you with us for lunch. So uh, to, to continue this conversation, but we'll have to do that lunch break. Right? Please. Okay. Thank you so much for your presentation. My name is Gabriela Guerras from Costa Rica. Gabriela. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, but he, I mean, look here. Yeah. Uh, I think it's very interesting to hear your project and your proposal. But I also believe that the global south is a very contrasting, diverse set of nations and states. So maybe your ideas could help some part of the global south, but not necessarily the whole uh, global south. And for that reason, I'm curious that if you know about the Costa Rican model, and if you do, I, I would like you to comment on it. The Costa Rican healthcare system. I don't know if you're familiar with it. No, I'm not. Can you, can you speak out more clearly, please? Okay, Costa Rica healthcare system. Do you yes. have a Yes, yes, yes. Um, um, I, I know the Costa Rica model. I'm reasonably familiar with it. and. Uh, I, I visited there in in the course of my in the course of my uh, in the course of my professional work. Uh, I think there are elements of the Costa Rica model uh, that many other from which many other countries can learn uh, in terms of the principles uh, undergirding it. 
uh, in terms of the, the social compact between the government and the governed. Now, by the way, interestingly, I shared this anecdote with you. I remember being struck by the fact that the instead of having the Minister of Health, they had the Minister of Health Stewardship. It was very interesting. I, I, I saw it on the, on the business card of the then minister that she shared with me, but back to uh, the substance of, uh, of our discussion. That compact between the government and the governed is essential. Costa Ricans do not primarily look outside when a question arises about their health system. They don't primarily look outside when they do this, this massive annual survey, the data collection that they, they do at the household level. They were not primarily looking outside when they started to combine telemedicine with diagnostics that made it possible uh, for people in places that were distant from the capital city to receive the results of their uh, mammograms and discuss with their, uh, with their doctors in their own localities and filter out those who really did not need to travel to the capital city. They looked inside and decided within their own compound, within their own system. And crucially, they have their own uh, very intense discussions. It's not, uh, it's not conflict free, but they engage in these transa transactions and bargaining to make their own system better. Having said that, and this is why I emphasize there are aspects from which other countries can learn. I recognize there are tremendous variations across and even within countries of the global south. So they will go at various paces, obviously, and they will have to negotiate these contacts within their own countries. And if you have a country that is in a country that is in active conflict, say in a war situation, obviously that's a different scenario. You're talking about humanitarian assistance there. That's a very different category. It also means, therefore, and this might roll the waters a bit, that since you have tremendous variations across countries, this calls into question the notion of setting a utopian target that everybody in, in health outcomes, that everybody must achieve on the same day if we just pour in a lot of money from outside. It makes more sense to have a vision in which every country makes progress. So if your coverage level of particular service is 40%, well, up it to 45% next year, and then 50% the year after, and then 55%, you get my drift. Gradual steady progress with accountability. Uh, instead of saying, you're gonna go from 40% to 90% uh, within the next three years, and yes, uh, there's all this money that's gonna come from outside. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't work uh, in, a, in a sustainable fashion. And it only serves to enable a combination of narcissistic charity in the North, institutional ossification in, in the North, and abdication of responsibility in the global South. Back to you. And I should say, on an optimistic note, like I wrote, a brighter future is possible. I think we need to hold on to that. So thank you.